Y'all, this is something that I want to just kind of premeditate and say this up top. You're gonna wanna shout about this. The reason we do all of this, the reason we turn gymnasiums into sanctuaries is because we and our entire goal and mission is to romance people to the heart of God because anytime Jesus got in the way of somebody's storm, their story changed. And so this is exciting. Just this year, in the first six weeks of 2024, we've seen 957 commitments to Jesus. That's a great opportunity to shout. That's massive. Maybe you were one of them. 957 commitments to Jesus. So we are in our evidence series, and there's kind of a little bit of a sticky statement with the evidence. And what we say is, if you walk with the Lord, there should be some sort of evidence. Should be some sort of evidence. People should know that you belong to Jesus. People should notice something different in your life than what they see from others. And then what we believe is when you carry the presence of God, then the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26 talks about the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, who helps, who reminds us of all the things that we're being taught and what we're growing in as believers. The Holy Spirit, as you get closer to the presence of God, the Holy Spirit will change the way you walk, it will change the way you talk, and it will change the way you act. It'll change the way you walk, so you start walking in your position, no longer your condition. It would change the way you talk. Some of y'all can form entire sentences with swear words. We're working on you. Amen. You're building your testimony. Okay. No, no. It'll change the way you talk. Maybe the things you used to joke about, things you used to say, you're like, wow, I'm proud of myself. I used to be able to cuss that person out. And now look what God has done in my life. It'll change the way you talk. Ultimately, it will change the way you talk act, the things that were holding you captive, the things that maybe drew you away from the local church or the spirit of God, you start wondering and noticing, wow, I'm starting to see change. I'm starting to see the fruit of the spirit overflowing in my life. I said this a couple weeks ago. I want to remind you that every single one of us, every single one of you, come on, say he's talking about me. Every one of us have a purpose. Every one of us have a call in our lives. Y'all believe that? Wave at me if you believe it. Come on, make some noise if you believe it. It's something the Lord has been reminding me of a lot lately is how the enemy isn't fighting me because I'm weak. I'll say this in a unified way. The enemy is not fighting us because we're weak. He's fighting us because of our purpose. He's fighting us because he knows if you would recognize who you are and whose you are, and you'll recognize daughter of God, Proverbs 31 woman, that there's healing in your hands and you recognize man of valor, come on, mighty man of valor, that the confidence and the boldness of God is not from you, it's from God to you and through you that becomes your strength. Yeah, the enemy knows, if I can, if I can cause her to be discouraged, if I can cause him to be discouraged, he's not attacking us because he thinks we're weak. He's attacking us or messing with our confidence and our joy because of our purpose. The Bible says, this is my anchor verse for week three of the evidence 2.0. It's found in Jeremiah 29, 11. It's on the screens. I'm reading out the new living on this one. This is for I know the plans I have for you. Now, if you've been raised up in church, churchy church, or just a little glimpse of church, you probably know this verse. If you're new to the faith, you're gonna be inspired because this is a phenomenal promise. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Come on, somebody give God praise for the reading of his word. It's the opening verse. And maybe you walked in here and you're like, okay, okay, real quick, I, you know, purpose and, and, and assignments and the call of God on my life. Pastor Daniel, you, you don't know my life. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I'm currently going through. And the truth is, I, I don't know that I'm qualified. Maybe you feel disqualified. I've got really great news. God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for purposed people. He's never looked for perfect. What he longs for is your heart. And every single day, the closer you get to his heart, the more he begins to change you for the better. Come on, I'm grateful for that. Can somebody give God praise one more time? Come on, I'm going to push y'all out of your comfort zone a little bit. All right, sermon title for week number three of The Evidence 2.0. Y'all ready for this? Write this down. The sound you carry. The sound you carry. We all carry a sound, whether you know it or not. We all carry a sound. When you walk into a room, the atmosphere shifts because of the sound you carry. We're gonna unpack this today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for ears to hear you. 
We need a mind sharp and ready to understand. And most importantly, God, we need a heart ready to receive. I love when Paul said, it's not with my enticing words or even my perfect oratory delivery, but it's the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. God, as I preach today, as I deliver this sermon today, I pray, God, that your anointing will fill this house because it's all of you and none of me. If you receive it today, shout amen. amen. Now, I said this week one, I need somebody to grab this. Some things can be taught. Other things have to be caught. I need somebody to grab this. God loves you. That's why you should clap. <laughs> God loves you. I need you to believe it. Say out loud, God loves me. Like really loves you. He spoke everything into existence except you. He shaped and molded you and took his time on you. Genesis 1 verse 27 actually describes that in detail and how we were created in the image of our God. That's why, y'all, that's why I love our city so much. I love the diversity of our city. I love the diversity of our beautiful community here at Hope City. I love that we can see God's workmanship and his different expressions of who he is through diversity. That's why we're intentional about diversity here at Hope City, because without diversity, we're missing pieces of the image of God. Come on, give God praise for a church that looks like heaven. This is a church that looks like heaven. Psalms 139, verse 13 and 14 says it this way, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 14 says, I praise you. Say that out loud, I praise you. I need you to grab that. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Have you ever had one of those, um, one of those days, just one of those days or one of those weeks? You've had one of those months, some of you are like, about a whole decade, like whatever you're about to say. I <laughs> No, it just kind of just feels like the, the sky's falling. Like, it's just, it just feels like it's just pouring down. Like, there's just a storm that's just lingering. And you're like, man, I just need to shake this day. I need to shake this week. How many of y'all have ever had one of those? So, so this week, I was feeling a little uh, under the weather. Now, I'm okay now. Some of y'all are like, well, when I talk to you in the lobby, keep your distance. Hey, Amen. <laughs> I was feeling a little down. I was feeling a little tired. I was feeling a little ran down. A little, 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 uh, like, little under the weather. And it's like in the midst of all of that, I'm praying and I'm putting together this sermon and uh, I get an alert on my phone. And, and, and instantly, my day got distracted because it said that somebody had attempted to charge $740 for a train ticket in Paris. And I said, baby, our anniversary is not till July. Amen. <laughs> She's like, wasn't me. <laughs> You'll be booking that trip. I'm not booking that trip. So, so then I get a phone call. I said, sir, did you attempt this $740 charge in Paris? I said, Paris, Texas? They're like, no, Paris, France. I said, mm, that ain't me. And then $820, they were just like popping up. And so they froze my car and said, sir, I want you to calm down. I was like, I'm good. Like, I wasn't even like, I was like quiet on the other end. I'm like, he's like, sir, calm down. I'm like, I'm fine. I don't even, I haven't yelled or anything like what is happening? And he said, uh, we have already shipped out. We've canceled that card and we've shipped out another card. Well, what he didn't realize was I have 83 reoccurring charges to that card. So I was like, thank you, sir. You've just added three hours to my day. I'm, I'm calling Xfinity. I'm calling everybody. Now, I'll be honest. I wanted to just kind of soak in that moment. I just wanted to be like, no, oh, be frustrated in that moment. And if you're watching online, that was you. I did pray constipation on you. Amen, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible, <laughs> but maybe I did. Okay, anyways, so, so I'm, I'm dealing with this. I, it distracted me from working on my sermon, and, and <laughs> Pastor Jackie popped in. She's like, how's the sermon going? Okay, it doesn't seem so good, and she like walked back, because by the way, we don't, I don't download these sermons off of like hotsermons.net. I, I don't get a word from the Lord for our church from chat GPT. There's no oil on that. So I'm spending time in the presence of God and all these alerts are popping up. And then I got locked out of uh, one of my logins. I'm like, this is frustrating. And the Lord reminded me, I literally felt the Lord say, Philippians 4. I said, like, okay. So I went to Philippians 4 and this is what it said. Paul's writings to the church of Philippi. He says, finally, believers, whatever's true. Finally, believers. Now he's talking to those who walk with the Lord and if you don't walk with the Lord, I'll give you an opportunity at the end. 
of today's service. But finally, believers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable and worthy of respect, whatever's right and confirmed by God's word, whatever's pure, whatever's admirable, and of good report or good repute, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, somebody say worthy of praise. Think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and plant them in your heart. So today, I wanna talk about the evidence of who you are as a worshiper and the importance of your praise. Because here's the truth. That moment, that three hours I'll never get back dealing with that drama, all that stuff I had to walk through, and some of y'all are like, that's easy breezy. I've dealt, I've dealt with that a 100 times over. But, but like, it, it was in the middle of a time that I needed to be focused on what God was gonna do this weekend. But then I was reminded of something I preached for a long time, how praise is more than an action. It's a posture and an attitude that says no matter what season I'm in or what I'm currently going through, I will remain thankful. I will, I will remain grateful. So I did, I stopped and I said, you know, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. It could have been, it, they could have taken the money from our checking account. Like this whole thing could have been, and I started saying, it could have been, it could have been worse. I went back to that Andy Minio song and said, it could have been worse. Could have been worse. Like it was this whole moment. I said to her, I was like, you know what? It could have been worse. But we got through it. We're on the other side of it. A, then, because the truth is, praise and that heart of God, I trust you, no matter what season I'm in or current issue I'm dealing with, I will remain grateful. My friend Brandon Lake wrote this song, and I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, so all that I have is a hallelujah. Y'all know that song? And I lo we love that song. We're like, I throw up my hands, God, and I praise you again and again. But, but the foundation of that song is I don't have much left. When everything is falling apart around me and it feels like the storms of life are caving in around me, all that I have is a hallelujah. All that I have is a grateful heart. Come on, somebody say, I'm gonna praise him anyways. Come on, I'm gonna praise him anyways. So praise and thanksgiving is verbalized faith. If you thank God after the fact, that's gratitude. If you thank God before it happens, that's faith. There's so much supernatural power in our walk with the Lord, in our relationship, through our praise and our worship. So this weekend, I wanna go in the direction of worship and the significance of our praise and the evidence of who we are and what we carry as the children of God. Last weekend at the end, we do this thing called a worship merge. It's what Pastor Jackie and I did when we come out behind the curtain and the worship team's going, by the way, give it up for Hope City Worship, man, leading so strong. And our production team and the lyrics and creative, come on, give them a hand too, it's phenomenal. So, so we come out, and last week, if you were in the room last week, we had a united praise, let the redeemed of the Lord, let's shout together moment. How many of y'all were here last week? Like we had this moment, it felt like heaven had touched earth. And it messed with some in like denominational, like ah, I've never done this before. But we talked to so many people in the lobby and they're like, I've never shouted like that before. That felt so freeing. And so this weekend, I couldn't shake it. I believe that breakthrough is about to be unlocked this weekend in somebody's life, that God's about to shift something. He's about to write victory in somebody's story. If that's for you, you should shout, that's for me. That's for me. That's for me. And our prayer this weekend is we're making history. Yeah, we shifted some service times, but we're launching a brand new service at 5.30, and I'm, I, 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 I'm not surprised we had resistance this week. Anytime you take territory, anytime we try to get more in the way of people's storms and pointing to Jesus, it messes with the enemy's camp. So we're, we're, we're gonna be leaning in because we believe that heaven is leaning in our direction. We believe that breakthrough is about to break out in the lives of worshipers. If that's you, shout one more time. That's me, come on. Come on, I'll take it. So this weekend, we're unpacking prioritizing praise and how when we turn our worries into worship, God will turn our battles into breakthrough. There was a season in my life, just being really transparent, uh, you know, statistically now, a full-time church attender, like that's my church, those are my pastors, those are my people. How many of y'all would consider Hope City your church? Like this is your house, like beautiful. That's great, 40% of you, so the rest are tourists. I'm good with that, okay. <laughs> my God, okay. No, but the truth is, they say an average Full-time church attender. Only 20% of the church comes every week. The other 80% comes.
comes every four to six weeks. And we know that. There's thousands of people that come through Hope City every weekend through our three campuses. And, and we, we recognize that. But there was a season in my life where I would show up in, and be in worship, or I would show up and go to church that weekend because I needed a, I needed a healing, or I needed a breakthrough, or I needed a, a quick fix from the presence of God. I almost treated the presence of God like an Ecedrin migraine, like I needed a painkiller moment. So I would show up, and I would worship, and I'd hear a message and be like, that's for me. That whole word was for me. And then I would go back out into the world and just do everything else I was doing before. And then I'd get in a low place again, that show back up again, because I treated the presence of God like a painkiller. But then I realized the presence of God is so much more than that. Yeah. I realized that he wants to heal our entire lives, yes. that he wants to put a fresh wind behind your sail, yes. that he wants to draw you away from the things that have been drawing you away from him yes. and pull you closer to his heart so that you can be changed and healed and fixed and delivered. And so there was this moment where I made it more about religion than relationship. And I want everybody to hear this. Since 2015, Hope City has never been built on religion. That's condemning and judging. It can be hurtful. Now, Hope City is built on relationship. This is not about convenient Christianity. This is not about a behavior modification program. This is about heart transformation. This is about the Spirit of God moving on our behalf in such a way where he's not a quick stop, Jesus, where you just pop in and get what you need. No, this whole thing is built on covenant. We truly believe there's a Savior who loves you. We truly believe that he does. This is the thing about the presence of God. He'll accept you where you are, but he won't leave you the way he found you. And I'm grateful for that because if he'd have left my dad the way he found him, my dad would still be a drug addict today. If he left my dad the way he found him, he'd still be an alcoholic. He'd still be running around on my family. He'd still be violent. No, no, no. He will not leave you the way he found you. Every time Jesus got in the way of anybody's storms, and it's all throughout the Bible, everything changed. Come on, somebody give God praise. I felt that whole moment was for somebody. If you're taking down notes, you can write this down. God pursues what he loves. Write that down. God pursues what he loves. And I love this verse so much. I end up quoting this verse outside the four walls of the church in just conversations, probably more than I preach it. Psalms 23, 6 says, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. Come on, somebody say out loud, he's pursuing me. Will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. God pursues what he loves. Like a father to a son, like a daddy to a daughter, July 10th, I'm excited, July 10th, my beautiful red, my beautiful redhead, my Kim Possible, come on somebody. We celebrate 20 years marriage, 20 years married. 20. Well, what's the secret to that? I pursue what I love. See, if we were just roommates and we just survived life and I'm like, oh, you still live here? She's like, boy, I'll beat you up. Anyways, we pursue, I pursue what I love. And she pursues me because she loves me and we have four babies and we love them and we continue. God pursues what he loves. Y'all, he keeps on chasing after you. I don't know if anybody else is excited about that, but that blesses me that he just keeps on chasing after you and pursuing you even when you're messy. Even when you're messy. The message translation of Psalms 23.6 says that the very beauty and love of Christ is chasing after you. Oh, that blesses me that even in the midst of poor decisions and domino effect issues of decisions maybe that you've made or maybe things that maybe hurt you because someone else inflicted pain on you, the goodness and mercy of God just keeps on pursuing and healing and restoring. We just have to lean into it. Again, this is not based upon my opinion. It's based upon the word. The Bible is really clear that God not only loves us, but I'm gonna shift it back to our original part that we've been talking about throughout this weekend is God really loves your worship and he really loves your praise. Like he literally is pursuing and seeking after it. The Bible says in John 4, 23, if you have a paper Bible, it's in red letters. And this means Jesus said these words, but the hour is coming and now is here. Come on, somebody say out loud right here, right now. When the true worshipers, whether you understand this fully or not, if you feel that you're a true worshiper, wave at me real quick. We're the true worshipers. We worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is, and here's the line, seeking such people to worship him. Now, 
uh, when I was growing up, I didn't fully understand this verse. It felt a little hyper-spiritual to me, like, like worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. You're like, next page. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> well, let me just break it down in layman's terms. This has nothing to do with your ability to clap on beat. That was just for the white people. You know what I mean? Like... You know your feet are on, but your hands are off. I don't, God has a sense of humor. I've told you guys this. Has nothing to do with your ability to sing on key. That's really good news. Like we were singing, you will make a way. Some of you are like, always make a way. And some of y'all are like, Pastor Daniel, this verse does not apply to me. I can't even sing on key. Just turn the music up louder and blend in, amen. Just blend in. Your kids are like, turn it up, mom and dad, turn it up. You know, you know who loves your worship? Like, like longs for your worship? Off key, on key, on time, off time? The spirit of the living God. He loves your praise. He loves your worship. So you better sing. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, you better sing. Look at your second choice and say, even you too. Like, even you. Because you know you're sitting next to them. You know what they sound like has nothing to do with your ability to sing on key. Watch this. If you're taking down notes, I need you to grab this. To worship the Lord in spirit and in truth is a pure, innocent, authentic expression of your faith and your trust in God. Now, here's the other thing. You also have to come in with transparency, and you need to reveal who you really are, because if you don't reveal who you really are, he can't heal who you really are. Some of you come in with all these facades and all these masks on. Take that off because God can't heal, restore, or deliver who you pretend to be. So in this place of worship, this should be a place of transparency. This should be a place of vulnerability where you say, hey, God, this is the real me. And he's like, oh, I didn't notice you through all that makeup. Like, <laughs> oh, that's my girl right there. <laughs> okay, stop it. We actually know somebody, I won't name who it is, but we know somebody, and they've been married like 45 years, and he has never seen her without her makeup on. And I remember telling Pastor Jackie that, like, like week one of what marriage, she said, oh, you're going to see me without makeup in about an hour. I'm just going to tell you right now, and I'm going to put a hat on, and we're just going to live, live life. And like, 45 years, she's like, oh, yeah, I go to bed with full makeup on, and then I wake up. And if that's your life, bless you. That's amazing. I'm not even mad at it. Okay. The truth is, he loves your worship. He loves your worship, and there should be some sort of evidence of gratitude that comes when you walk with the Lord that says, no, no, this is me, and with my hands lifted and my voice lifted, I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to praise you anyways. I'm going to praise you in the middle of that doctor appointment. I'm going to praise you in the midst of that layoff. I'm going to praise you in the midst of that frustrating moment. I'm going to praise you in the midst of that brokenhearted moment. I'm going to praise you in the midst of that adversity. I'm going to praise you anyways because I know that you fully love me. I don't think I fully understood this until we had kids. So my, my boy Brecken just turned 15 years Eve, and then we had our daughter Finley just a couple years after Brecken. And Brecken, like, man, I felt like a dad. Like, I got my boy. When I had Finley, it made my heart soft. I mean, I remember telling Jackie, like, I don't know, anything that she wants, I'm gonna get her a pony. I don't even care if HOA cares. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they can find me. They can send me letters in the mail. But whatever that little girl wants, I don't think I fully understood what the heart of a father looked like until I had my daughter Finley. And I remember standing in the hallway and hearing her sing and hearing her worship, and I was overwhelmed with emotion. And I can't back this theologically, but I remember thinking, this must be, I felt like I got a little glimpse of what God must feel like. What God must feel like when we worship. I think that's my girl. Oh, that's my boy. I felt like I got a little glimpse of that because here on this earth, y'all, we were designed and created to be in fellowship and relationship with him. In the old covenant, let's go all the way back. In the old covenant, the presence of God was locked up in a box, the Ark of the Covenant. But as we progress throughout the word, God sends his only son, Jesus, to hang on a cross, to, to bridge the gap between him and humanity so that we could have access and be in relationship with him. Like we can be in his presence. You can pray and talk to him and spend time in his presence. And so we're designed and created to worship. 
We're designed and created to be in relationship with him. The Bible says in Psalms 150, verse six, let everything, come on, somebody say everything. everything. I wrote in the margin of my Bible, even cats. I know. So I'm not a huge fan. Okay, let everything, I mean, they have breath. Okay, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Come on, somebody say out loud, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, true story, no shade at all. I almost edited this. Edited it? I almost edited this for this service. That's a weird way to say it. Edit it? Edited it. It's like Bone Thugs and Harmony. Like, edited it. That's a lot of extra words, Buster Rhymes. Okay, anyways, listen. So, no shade on other churches or style of expression of worship and what they do. But uh, we used to travel. We used to travel on a tour bus. We used to do music all over, all over the nation and the world. And uh, we, we were traveling, and we went to this church in the Midwest, and, and they, they just had, uh, they had a Psalms 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, sort of foundation. It was literally on their sign, and I was like, that's super cool, and, and it's the Bible, and that's great. So we're, we're, we're like sound checking, and this guy walks in. This is a true story. Walks in with a large rabbit. Has anybody ever seen those like super large rabbits? You can Google it. Like they have the size, like they're the size of a golden doodle. They have the head of a human. Like they're huge. And this guy just walks in casually with a little bee. And I was like, my God, that's a huge rabbit. And then the lady walks in with a cat. I'm like, okay, this is getting different. And then the lady walks in with like a bird cage. I'm like, okay, this is just getting fun. And about halfway through the worship service, I realized people to pet ratio were pretty much the same. Every person that came in brought a pet. It was a, it was a wild night. I'll be honest, it was super, like long hair just floating in the room. I'm like, what about allergies? They're like, we have great filtration system. I'm like, this is wild. And so at the very end, I asked the pastor, I'm like, what was the deal with all the animals? And he was like, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I said, that's incredible. And just so y'all know, we're never gonna do that here. I don't say, <laughs> y'all keep the animals like that at home. Amen. But if you do have a large rabbit, I do wanna see it. Okay, great. Y'all, here's the truth. It's ridiculous. I almost didn't tell that story in every service, and I just keep at it because it's, it's fun. Okay, here's the truth. All of us, I said this up top, the sound you carry, all of us carry a sound. For some of you, that sound is loneliness. For some of you, that sound is brokenness, and some of you feel hopeless. Some of you, that sound sounds like anxiety. Some of you, that sound sounds like depression, restless, frustration. The list goes on and on and on. Some of y'all are like, you didn't even say mine. <laughs> no, the truth is the list goes on and on. And the enemy wants to try to play tricks with our mind. He wants to try to continue to lie and dupe us into believing the lies that he's pushed onto us that we're never going to break away from that figure eight cycle of brokenness. And then ultimately his goal is for us to forfeit the purpose and the call of God on our lives. So that we never become who God has called us to become and we never walk out the plan and the call because here's the truth. There are people's lives, I've said this many times, but I need you to catch it. There are people's lives attached to your destiny. Like I have a call, I have a plan, I have a purpose that God has for me, his plan, his call, his purpose through my life, but I can only reach as many people I'm called to reach. There are people in your sphere of influence. It may only be one or two or three. It may be five. It may be the nations, but there are people's lives connected to your purpose, and the enemy knows this. If I can just dupe her long enough, if I can convince him long enough to believe the lie that he's not good enough, she's not smart enough, creative enough, funny enough, anointed enough, then not only does it rip you off, I feel this strong, not only does it rip you off, but it rips all the people off connected to your purpose. There's a call on your life. Somebody say out loud, I'm chosen by God. I'm chosen. I'm chosen by God. And throughout this evidence series, we want us to grab that when you walk with the Lord, there should be some sort of evidence that you have been chosen by God. Colossians 3, verse 12 says it this way in the NIV, therefore as God's chosen people. Say it again until you believe it, I'm chosen by God. I'm chosen, by God. chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility gentleness and patience. See, when you recognize that you're chosen, you'll begin to live out of the overflow of the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit will begin to be active in your life because people will start seeing in your life, ah, she's so compassionate. They'll start seeing the kindness through us. They'll start saying he's so humble and they're so gentle and they're patient. Like Colossians just talked about, people will start seeing the fruit 
of the overflow of your connection to the vine. John 15, five talks about he, he's the vine and we're the branches. And if we remain in him and him in us, we'll bear much fruit. There's evidence. Come on, somebody say there's evidence. And when you recognize that you're chosen, everything changes. There's a residue that ends up on your life. I remember when I played basketball, I'd go to all these rec gyms on Saturdays and you kind of stand off to the side. There's always a couple guys there that are super respected. They end up the captains and they're like, okay, you pick your team and you pick your team and everybody has like nicknames. They're like, I got the heat. I'll take hot sauce. I'll take, they all have nicknames. And I'm standing off to the side one Saturday and they're like, hey, Superman, because I'm wearing a Superman shirt. I don't know why. I found it at Goodwill. I was wearing a Superman shirt. They're like, what's your name? I'm like, Dan. And they were like, all right, Super Dan's on my team. I'm like, cool, now I have a nickname. So, but there was something that shifted. You could see it in the morale of everybody. When you were chosen, it was like, hey, hey guys, it's my time. Okay, I'm out here on this court. But if you weren't chosen, we were sitting off to the side, maybe five, six games. I need somebody to hear this today. You're chosen by God. He sees you. He hears you. He's seen the tears hit your pillow. He knows your worries and your fears. He sees your concerns. He knows your dreams. He knows everything about the intricacies of your life. He shaped and molded and took his time on you. He sees you. Can you close your eyes and just say, he sees me? He sees me. In Genesis, Hagar said, she said, I know the God and I now know him as the God who sees me. God, today I thank you that whoever that was for, that they feel noticed, seen, and they feel valuable today. But I have something else to let you in on, and maybe you grew up in churchy church where everything they talked about was like the devil. The devil's gonna get you. Like somebody sneezes three times in a row, and they're like, that's a demon. Like, I pray that coughing demon off of you. I don't, I don't know your past. I don't know your story. But there is a real enemy. There's a real devil and he really doesn't like you. Some of you are like, that was worth the trip. Thanks for, I'm glad that I came this weekend. No, but here's the good news. We as Christians, as someone who is a Christian, which means Christ-like, as you're a follower of Jesus, you'll begin to recognize the power and authority. Somebody say power, power. and authority. authority. That we carry from him. And then what ends up happening is you begin to live a life of unshakable faith. In Luke chapter nine, Jesus actually gave his disciples he said, I've now given you power and authority over the works of the devil. And then we are equipped. This is the thing. If Jesus' disciples had power and authority given from God to them, the Bible says that it is no longer us who lives. When you ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, it's no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. So if the disciples have power and authority, oh, come on, somebody. We have power and authority. You should praise him a little bit better than that. That's huge. But let me give you a verse. James chapter four, verse seven to the skeptic and the amplified. So submit to, that's a choice, the authority of God. Resist the devil. Stand firm against him. And he will what? Flee. He will flee. You ever seen somebody flee? I'm not talking about a flea like, oh, what is that? That's a flea. No, when somebody's fleeing, like they're, they, they, they're moving quick. It says this, that when we resist the devil, it's not the power from you, it's the power and the authority of God to you and through you. Where we have the authority to say, no, 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 no devil, not in my house. No, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. Like, no, 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 not in my marriage. No, no, not in my kid's life. No, no, see, see when that addictive issue uh, it may run in your family. I've prophesied this and preached this before. You may have addiction and struggle and alcoholism and all kinds of issues running in your family, but the moment it ran into you, it was broken off. That generational struggle, those generational issues, no, no, you have permission to be the first in your bloodline to do things different and to see the hand of God move in a different way in your life. Say it out loud. I have power and the authority from God over the enemy. Come on, give God praise one more time. Woo. So 1 Peter 5, 8 gives us a little bit more insight. It says, stay alert. Another translation says, and stay sober-minded. Some of you are like, well, I don't drink, so I'm good. <laughs> to stay sober-minded is to not allow all the things that are contending for your attention to bog you down and keep you from hearing the voice of God. Stay alert. 
well, I haven't heard the voice of God in a while. But you can read and see the Spirit of God through his word. Maybe you haven't heard his audible voice or felt the intuition or even that nudge, that whisper from the Lord, but you can see his promises and hear his promises and feel his promises in his word. And the Bible says this, stay alert. Why? Watch out for your great enemy, the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Look at the person next to you and say, it's not gonna be me. And then look at your second choice and say, I run faster than you. I'm telling you right now. It's ridiculous. I'm talking about lions. No, but when you recognize the authority you have, you have a different kind of confidence as a daughter and son of the living God that says, I will resist the devil and I will watch him flee. Come on, that spirit of depression broken off. That spirit of anxiety broken off. That spirit of heaviness that Isaiah 61.3 talks about broken off of your life. Again, as for me and my house, come on, I have power and authority through the word of God and through the power of God's presence to resist the enemy. Come on, the devil's a liar. Somebody, somebody say that out loud. The devil's a liar. Where God is the author and the finisher of our faith, the devil is the deceiver. He's the liar. The devil knows he can't take you out, but he'll try to wear you out. He'll try to wear you down. He'll try to discourage you to the point of giving up. And he knows if he can keep you quiet, he knows that if he can rob you of your breakthrough through silence, if he can keep you bound, keep you silent, keep you from praising and worshiping, and hinders you from, it, 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 it smothers out your ability to rise up and say, I will worship anyways. I, I will praise God anyways. Here's my, here's, here's really good news. Write this one down. The enemy's trying to keep you quiet. Why? Because he knows your praise and worship is valuable to the heavenly father. Now, I know you grammatical people say, isn't it your praise and worship are valuable to the Heavenly Father? This is in my notes. Come on, your praise and worship, it's valuable to the Heavenly Father. The enemy notes that walls fall when you shout. Yeah. Well, come on, what are you talking about, Joshua 6? Yeah. When Joshua is standing there with the priests and over two million Bible theologians say in the army, standing at the wall of Jericho in Joshua 6, on the seventh day, it says he, he tells the priest, blow your horns, and he commands the army to shout. Now, in the natural, this is ridiculous. What is yelling at a wall gonna do? Nothing in the natural. But because of Joshua's obedience. See, I've said this before, obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. So because of his obedience, he positioned himself at the wall in the natural and said, God, your will, not my will, so he positioned himself in the natural and the spirit of God said, have the priest blow the horn and command the army to shout. The super collided with the natural and the supernatural happened and everything on the other side of their shout of praise, the promises of God, everything God had promised was on the other side, come on of their shout. I feel like somebody should shout right there. The enemy knows that walls fall. The enemy knows that victory is written in your story and that we have access to the power of God's presence in the supernatural and when we access it, things begin to change. A thief doesn't break into a vault just to chill and have a cup of coffee. No, a thief breaks into a vault because there's something of value in there. The enemy knows how valuable your praise and worship is. So it should be no surprise that the enemy doesn't want you to recognize it. It should be no surprise that he wants to try to put a wet blanket on your ability to give God praise. I remember when we walked through, Pastor Jackie and I walked through a health challenge slash health scare with her health years ago. And I remember inconclusive result after inconclusive result, doctor appointment after doctor appointment, and we were finally able to get into this specialist. And the night before, she was upstairs washing her face, and I'm downstairs praying, walking, trying to figure this thing out, and I'm, I'm fretting, and I'm, I'm, be honest, I'm struggling, I'm worrying a little bit. And I'm like, babe, you good? She's like, God's always had my back. She's like, he wrapped me up, like a little kid when I was little. He wrapped me up in his presence like a blanket. He had me back. He had my back then and he'll have my back now. I'm good. You can stay up. I'm gonna keep washing my face. So I did what every good husband should do and I was doing the dishes. And all the ladies say. Amen. I was loading the dishwasher. Okay, that's it's a little different. Some of, you, some of you gentlemen are like, you have a microphone. You have a responsibility not to say things like that. Now, I'm not a big, like, I have big dreams, but I'm not, like, a big prophetic dreamer. For those of you who maybe, like, dream, you're like, I'm always seeing dreams. Like, we, I talk to people, and they're like, I saw you on an ocean. <laughs> they're out of breath. 
I saw you in an ocean. I was like, was I on a boat? No, you weren't. You were just floating. I was like, good Lord, that's not for me. <laughs> so anyways, I don't have these type of dreams, but that particular night, I had this wild, vivid dream. It was like a rotating door, like if you go to New York City or something, and the door going into like a fancy hotel or something, and I, and I saw this revolving door, you know, the one that like you go in and you're like, <laughs> and you never should go around twice, but you're like, I'm doing it. I'm gonna do it one more time. <laughs> I see this in my dream and I wake up. But not before I saw in the dream, Jackie and I walking out of that revolving door and shouting so loud and giving God praise. I saw this. So the next morning, y'all, I woke up excited. So we go to the doctor, we walk through all these tests, and the doctor looks at her and says, hey, I don't know what happened up to this point. For 43 days, I'm seeing your journey. I don't know what happened the past 43 days, but I can tell you today, there is no cancer. There is no tumors. Your cells are healthy. Now, we walked in like this. We walked out like this. Like, So, so we, we're walking out the side door, and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, babe, it was one of those doors. So we went in it. <laughs> and she was like, don't do it a second time. I'm like, I got you. I'm going to do one. And I didn't realize a lady had gotten in there with me. So she was like <laughs> kind of pushing me along. <laughs> it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's like a weird dance. And as soon as we came around and we were stepping outside, just like the dream, I shouted so loud, thank you, Jesus. I mean, like, as loud. And Jackie was praising, we were praising, and the lady that was in there with me is like, ah, Jesus, like she yelled. And I said, do you know him? And she said, no. And I said, well, you're about to. Come on, we're about to pray. Watch this. Your shout of praise, your shout of praise is contagious. It's a domino effect. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, that the blood of the lamb is the word of your testimony. When you tell your story, how I was broken, now I found my breakthrough. I went from nothing to something. I went from rejected to accepted. I went from burdened to healed and restored. And even if you're in the process of that moment, you can still praise him anyways. And I remember we prayed with this lady. We talked to this lady because when you, ha, huh, when you experience that freedom from God, you can pass it on. That's why we say all the time here, some of y'all, I've seen it in worship moments. Somebody will be worshiping, somebody will be jumping up and down praising, and people will be standing next to them like, <laughs> why, how come she's so excited? Don't judge somebody's passion until you know their past. Don't judge someone's reflection and expression of their gratitude until you know what they've been through. And don't be the reason somebody doesn't get their breakthrough because you're like, can you just please calm down? No, no, get your freedom. Walk out set free. Walk out with that deposit from heaven. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm telling you right now. But the truth is, there are all kinds of different expressions. People lifting their hand, like, boldly. Some are like, I caught a fish this big. Some are like, field goal. Like, however your expression of worship is. That's why I opened up earlier by saying it doesn't matter if it's on key or off key or on time or off time. He loves your worship. Come on, somebody shout out loud. I'm chosen by God. And the more you spend time in the presence of God, the closer you get to Jesus, guess what? You're going to look more like Jesus. Which is why some of you look more and smell more like the club than you do church. And that's okay. I'm glad you're here. I'm stepping on somebody's J's. The closer you are to the world, the more you'll smell like the world. You can't get that close to fire and not end up smelling like smoke. So the closer you get to Jesus... The more you spend time in his presence, you start smelling like peace and hope. You start seeing and your sound sounds like freedom. And so, so my wife is a, is a superhero. I have, uh, typically I don't have all the time. I don't have the time, but we're not buttoning up against another service until 530. So I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to tell the story. So she's like Kim Possible, real life superhero. And so I get a phone call from my oldest son. He's like, dad, we were just in a car wreck. And I heard her say, hang up the phone. I'm still dealing with this. I'm like, uh-oh. Because if I, there's one thing about my wife, like she'll put some lip gloss and she'll put that makeup on, but if I'm ever like needing to get into a fight in a Walmart parking lot, I'm calling her, okay? <laughs> That's not really happening, but anyways. So, so she's driving along and she sees this drunk driver. He's pulling a trailer with a pickup truck and uh, she calls the cops and she's talking it through and she's like, this guy's erratic. He's gonna end up hitting somebody and he did. He ended up slamming into the back end of somebody else's car, an older gentleman who was trapped in his car. 
And so because she's a superhero, she didn't just drive on by. She pulled her SUV off to the side of the road, put her emergency flashers on, waited for traffic to go by, and she goes over and muscles that door open because she has superhuman strength, it seems, pulls this guy out of the car, this older gentleman, get, like pretty much carries him off to the side. And he's here right now. I'm pro- no, he's not. He's not right here. <laughs> I wish he was. I really did. It would make this so much better. If we can get him at the 530 service, it would be incredible if he was sitting over here. I wish he was. Like, it wouldn't be that hard. You could just look at the police report. All right. So she gets him off to the side. He's like shook up. And, and then this other guy doesn't see the car that was slammed into. So he ends up driving his truck, slams into that car. Like, if she wouldn't have gotten that guy out of that other car, he probably would have lost his life. Well, then another car doesn't see it and says slamming into that car. She swerves and runs into Pastor Jackie's SUV off the side of the road. Why are you telling us this? So our SUV is now in the body shop. So now we have a rental. Why are you telling us that? I, I always have a point to these stories. Just, just lock in. This, this SUV, this rental vehicle that we have, now some of y'all are connoisseurs when it comes to air fresheners in your car. I prefer leather. Some of you enjoy that scent, black ice. <laughs> black ice to me is a migraine inducer. I don't know what it is. It, it like gets in my pores, it's all over my clothes. If we're gonna go on a ride together, I'm looking in my closet, she's like, what's taking you so long? I'm like, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna throw out because it's gonna be disposable today because I can't wear any clothes in that car. Like I can't stand the smell. It's like, whew, and I dug all through the car. I found it, that little device, it was like underneath the seat. It was like, oh Lord, well how are you telling us that? Because there's a residue in the natural. There's a residue that gets on us every time. Now, I had a lady almost fight me in the lobby. She's like, I like black ice. It's in my car right now, just so you know. I'm like, why are y'all puffed up? Like, what's going on right now? No, but the truth is, there's a residue in the natural. Why are you telling us that? The same is true in the spirit. The more you get in the presence of God, there is something that begins to just overshadow you. And the spirit of God begins to overshadow shadow you with his grace and his mercy, and then you wake up, and it's not just about you. You say, I want to get in the way of somebody's storm today. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 said, it's the goodness and love of God that draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. But The same is true when we live too carnal. But the same is true when we allow the flesh to overshadow and overtake our spirit. The Bible says, Paul very clearly says, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Watch this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, says to abstain Ooh. from every form of evil. Withdraw and keep away from it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's a residue on your life. It changes atmospheres when you walk into the room. Let me, let me challenge some parents here. Outside these four walls, mom and dad or future mom and dad, let your kids see you worshiping. Yeah. Yeah. Let your kids see you shouting from the top of your lungs. Let your kids see you lifting your hands at home and singing and saying, well, it feels like, it feels like there's chaos. It feels like things are falling apart. Yeah, but we're gonna praise him anyways. We're gonna trust him in this season. We're gonna trust him because this, is, this too shall pass. And I trust that God is gonna show up and do what he's promised. And his promises don't have expiration dates on them. He said he was faithful to complete the work he started in me. So I'm gonna believe it. We turn on worship music at night. Our kids see mom and dad praying. Our kids see mom and dad praising and worshiping. Our kids feel the residue that's being developed and built in our house because when you set that type of atmosphere, what ends up happening is you can either be a thermometer that tells the temperature or a thermostat that establishes the temperature. So come on, parents and future parents, establish the right things. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. Jesus came to produce life in us and through us, which also translates to a sound of freedom, healing, hope, and joy in us. Look at this, Psalms 34, verse 1 and 3. This is pretty... Definitive. This is a great directive. It says, I will bless the Lord when everything is going well. I will bless the Lord when my money is, is finally reached the point of like, I've reached my goal. I will bless the Lord when my health is perfect. Some of y'all are like, what's he reading? I will bless the Lord, say it with me, at all times. How often? 
When? I will bless the Lord at all times. I love this line, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times. Come on, say that out loud. I will bless the Lord at all times. Psalms 107 verse 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Who has redeemed me from my days of trouble? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you've been redeemed, you should talk about it. If you've been delivered, you should shout about it. If you've been healed, you should tell everybody about it. Because what it does is it keeps building your faith up, but it inspires and builds others' faith. Because the enemy wants to try to dupe you into believing that you're the only one dealing with it. You're the only one walking through it. You're the only one struggling with it. So then you, you, you meet somebody who's been redeemed, and they're saying so. You're like, well, wait a minute. You went through that, and now you're on the other side? If God did it for you. He can do it for me. Come on, say, if, you, if you've been redeemed, you should say so. That's a good opportunity. Because if God's in it, y'all, no matter what you're dealing with, if God's in it, it's not over. I believe with all my heart that throughout this series that God wants to unlock the evidence of our relationship with him more than ever in a corrupt, broken, carnal-minded, tense, misinformed world and nation that we're living in more than ever. We need the hand of God and the voice of God speaking through his church. And the church is not these four walls. The church is us. us, us. We're the body of Christ. Some of you are like the awkward pinky toe, but we're still the body. Amen. <laughs> we're still the body. Write this one down. There is supernatural, and I'm almost done. Some of you are like, all right, so you're going to preach all the way till the 530? <laughs> is that what we're doing? Is this a lock-in? Are we stuck here? <laughs> this is fun. All right, number two. Write this one down. It's on the screen. There is supernatural traction in your praise and worship. There's supernatural traction. I was driving through a neighborhood the other day and there was like this, there was like this trail that kind of went off and uh, I have a Jeep, I'm a Jeeper. Anybody own a Jeep in here? Like you're like a Jeep people? Like Jeep people, we have like our own little wave. We got these little weird ducks. It's like a cult, okay? But it, we're, we're, we're a little secret society of sorts. Uh, you can't do what I'm about to tell you about in a Ford Festiva, okay? So I'm like, I want to drive over there. There were, no, there were no marks from any other vehicle. I'm like, but I'm going to go over there. So I end up off-roading, drive over there, and I got fully stuck in a ditch. I got stuck in the mud. She wasn't with me. Popped that thing in a four-wheel drive. Wham! Got out of there, came back out on the road, and somebody was like, well done. I'm like, mm-hmm, amen. And then I had more, G- I had more like, uh, uh, mud and stuff on it, so other Jeep people respected me. They didn't think I was just like a drive around on the main road sort of Jeeper, but I'm a real Jeeper. Come on, make some noise if you own a Jeep. Not that many. It's a small little club. Okay, great. Why are you telling us that? There is traction. There is supernatural traction, almost like supernatural built-in four-wheel drive when you walk with the Lord. God will give you supernatural strength in the midst of valleys and ruts in your life because they will come and we will walk through them. David said in Psalms, even though, Psalms 23, 4, even though, even when I walk through the darkest valley, he didn't say I might, he said when. When I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? You're close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Here's another promise. I actually quoted this verse and preached out of this passage at our first Wednesday service at the Woodlands campus last week. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, another translation says rivers of difficulty. They will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. There is supernatural traction in your praise to overcome. Why? Because he is with you. Come on, give him praise one more time. Supernatural traction, I believe that. And last but not least, here it is. Number three on the screens, there is breakthrough. Breakthrough. Come on, somebody say, I'm getting my breakthrough this weekend. There's breakthrough in your praise and worship. I love reading stories in the Bible because as I'm reading through these verses, I'm like, God, if you showed up for them, I know you can do this for me. That's why anytime, if you're believing for a miracle in your physical body, read through all the miracles that Jesus performed in the word and grab a hold and say, God, if you did it for the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew 9, 20, I know that you can do this for me. I got a whole message I'm gonna be building out around Revelation 1, 
where it talks about how he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. But here's the good news. He's also the God of the middle. So whatever you're going through right now, he's in the middle of it with you right now. And watch this, Acts 16, verse 25 through 26 says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now for context, Paul is writing this series of verses from a prison. He's writing, he's in a dungeon. Him and his buddy Silas are in the lowest of low places, but they chose to pray and sing hymns to God. It was so important. The Spirit of God showed up like a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prisons were shaken. I love the beginning of verse 26. It says, suddenly. Somebody should shout, suddenly. <laughs> suddenly. Suddenly, God showed up and breathed and all at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. When you keep your joy, and you keep your confidence in God and you keep your praise, I'm telling you, you'll keep your strength. Close your eyes for just a moment. God, no matter what the doctor says, we're gonna keep our joy. We're gonna keep our strength. We're gonna keep our praise. Doesn't matter what our bank account says, what that marriage that looks like it's in trouble. Those that are in need of a miracle, that need restoration or deliverance, God, I pray today that we serve a big God. Instead of talking about how big our storm is, we're gonna talk about how big our God is. And God, we're gonna choose this weekend to allow you to move in such a way in our lives that the sound of brokenness, the sound of depression, anxiety, the sound of heaviness or hopelessness. God, we're gonna allow you, because it's a choice, to posture and position ourselves. First Peter 5, 6, under your mighty hand, I pray, God, that today you swap out that broken sound for a sound of freedom, that you're gonna swap out that sound of hopelessness for hope and peace and joy. I pray, God, today that there's a morale boost. I pray, God, today that somebody's about to get their joy back. Somebody's gonna walk out laughing again and have the joy of the Lord that's gonna be their strength God, I thank you today that they all leave here today with confidence that you have not brought them this far just to have brought them this far. And God, I thank you that if they, today, God, this is my prayer, that you would reveal what you're doing in their life because if they knew what you were planning and what you were doing, God, they would not give up now. And God, I pray today that you replace that sound. Would y'all stand to your feet? I feel a shift in the room as we bring this in for a close. Some of you, listen to me, you're gonna get your joy back. We're gonna jump back into this song, Praise. And I need you to sing it, even if you don't feel it. I need you to muster up the strength to say, now I'm gonna get my sound of joy back. I'm gonna get my freedom back. Come on, lift your hands towards heaven. God, I thank you today that you're replacing, you're replacing that sound of heaviness for your peace, for your freedom, for your spirit. Come on, Kim. Y'all ready, y'all ready, y'all ready? And I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Praise the Lord. Come on, even if you can't sing on key, sing it again. David said, I'll become even more undignified than this because I'm gonna talk about and tell about what my God has done and what he is faithful to complete in my life. With every eye closed just for a moment, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do a little self-awareness moment, a little self-check just for a moment. What's the sound that you carry? I'm not gonna ask you to reveal it. I'm not gonna ask you to come up and get on a microphone and tell us. Between you and the, and the Lord, as a son, as a daughter, what's the sound that you currently are carrying? 
Does it look like anxiety? Does it look like fretting and bitterness? Does it look like hopelessness? Does it look like loneliness? Does it look like depression? Does it look like insecurity? What's the sound that you carry? Pastor Daniel, I haven't had my joy in a long time. It's definitely not that. Somebody hurt me or that situation disrupted my momentum. I felt like I almost have a crisis of faith. What's the sound that you carry? Let me first and foremost commend you for being in the room. Let me acknowledge that you're watching online for those of you who are joining us online and you would say, but here's my posture of surrender today. I want God to replace my sound with his sound. I want God to replace my sound that I've been carrying, that I've been choosing to carry. And I want him to replace it with his sound, his sound of freedom, his sound of joy, his sound of overwhelming peace, his sound of hope, his sound of perseverance, fight, the sound of courage. I'm gonna walk out better than when I came in because I'm gonna lay down the sound I've been carrying and allow him to put a deposit that's his sound. If that's you and you would say, I've been carrying around a sound that doesn't look like the word doesn't look like what you've been talking about, Pastor Dean. I've been carrying around a sound of brokenness. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand real quick? I'm just looking. Amazing. And how many of y'all want God to replace that sound with his sound today? Come on, that should be all of us. How many of y'all want him to replace? So here's what I want to do with your hands down just for a moment. I'm going to give two invitations today. Here's the two. I'm gonna to count to three in just a moment. If either one of these two invitations apply to you, just slip up your hand. I promise we won't embarrass you. This costs you no money. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse nine and 10, to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. He's about to write victory in your story. You're about to leave today in confidence that you stand in his faithfulness. It says that he throws your sins as far from the east as the west. Yeah, but Pastor Daniel, you don't know what I've done. He does. And he's faithful and just, according to his word, to forgive you and heal you and restore you. That's the first invitation. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. I don't actively carry his sound because I don't even know him. I watched my father walk to the front of this room, bound by addiction and bound by brokenness, completely and totally healed and restored in one encounter with Jesus. He can do it for you. Second invitation, I used to know the Lord. It's a miracle I'm even in the room. It's a miracle I'm even alive. I never should have made it. I got caught up in the prodigal life and my sound sounds reckless. The truth is I don't know him like I used to. I've fallen away. Maybe you got hurt. Maybe it was church hurt. Maybe a leader lied to you or somebody hurt you. And maybe you showed up today and this is your first step towards coming back to the heart of God and this message today convinced you of the fact that there's more to life than the way you've been currently living it. You want to come into the presence of God and align your heart to his heart again so that you can rededicate your life today. First invitation, I want to give Jesus my life for the very first time. Number two, I want to rededicate my life and I want to come back to the heart of God. I want him to swap out my reckless sound for his sound. Number three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? Would you just say, that's me? I want to give my life to Jesus. I see you and you and you and you. His hands everywhere. Come on, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to rededicate my life. Everything is about to change. Come on, Hope City, give God praise. There's about 35 hands that said, you're talking about me. Beautiful. I want everybody to pray this prayer. Nobody leave it just yet. If you could just wait just two more minutes, I promise I'm going to get you out of here. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus. Today, I'm surrendering everything. There's all my sin. There's all my struggles. There's all my issues. There's all my shame. I'm asking for your forgiveness. From this moment on, I'm going to choose to live for you. Jesus, thank you for exchanging your life for mine. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it because you said I was worth it. From this moment on, I'm going to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. One more time, give him praise. Let's go. Yeah, come on.